Hi friends, welcome back to this webinar hosted by Advancing Eco Agriculture. I'm John Kemp and our topic for today's webinar is how to manage vascular infections. These are bacterial infections that occur inside plant tissue, some of them inside the phloem and xylem and then some of them in case of uh, diseases such as bacterial canker on stone fruit actually occurring in uh, outside the cell cytoplasm and throughout the entire tree structure. So managing these diseases, there are many diseases on a broad variety of different crops that are that function in this way. Xylella fastidiosa is known as Pierce's disease in grapes, but actually is the causative organism for over 500 different diseases in different crops worldwide. And it ranges and includes um, citrus greening and gossus wilt on corn, sudden death syndrome and soybeans. There's kind of this really long list of various uh, different diseases that can cause significant crop damage and historically are very difficult to manage with pesticide applications because there aren't very many particularly effective treatments known to treat these diseases inside plant tissue. We've had some interesting experiences over the last decade and we've learned a lot in the last few years about what allows these diseases to express themselves inside plant tissue. And so when we first put this topic together for this webinar, my idea was to share and describe what we have learned with these different diseases and to say that, okay, if we have Pierce's disease, then we can address manganese and we can address the form of nitrogen that we're managing and give very specific recommendations for specific groups of diseases. But as we started putting the information together that we wanted to share in the webinar, I realized that putting together those specific recommendations without the historical context and without the background knowledge and information really would make, it's not that it would make no sense, but there would be lots of missing dots. And so the topic for discussion today is not so much going to be if you have X disease, apply these five nutrients, although we certainly are going to talk about some of the nutritional profiles that are present. But instead, I wanted to focus on the background historical context of what are the nutritional parameters and what are the environmental factors that have to be in place in order for these diseases to become really virulent and really express themselves very strongly. I think the information that we're going to be discussing on this webinar, uh, for those of you who have heard some of our information in the past, is going to be famil somewhat familiar, but I hope to connect the dots, particularly for these diseases, in ways that they may not have been connected quite before, and to describe the environmental and nutritional context that is required for these diseases to really express themselves. So without any further ado, I'm going to dive right in. What I realized as in, in our consulting work at Advancing Eco Agriculture over the last decade, we've had some remarkable successes in reversing infectious diseases that are supposedly not reversible, such as bacterial canker on cherries, which is one of the stories that I want to share today. But many of these vascular bacterial infections are, for, for lack of a better analogy, they're considered to be the cancer of different crops because there is no particularly effective treatment that is widely known. And yet, in some cases, we have observed these diseases to completely reverse themselves and stay reversed for years. And never, and in fact, in some cases, uh, we now have about eight, I think eight, nine years of experience where they have never returned. Um, so we can't say indefinitely because we don't have that much experience, but they haven't returned for long periods of time. And the reason, the way that we were able to manage these diseases was not through a pesticide or a fungicide application, but through changing the nutritional environment and the redox environment within the plant. So I want to offer some context for how that functions and the flow. And I'm going to be framing the conversation in the webinar today around these four primary diseases. Xylella fastidiosa, 
which grape producers know as Pierce's disease, but it also is the causative organism for over 500 other diseases globally. Uh, bacterial canker, Pseudomonas syringiae, uh, crown gall and walnuts, Agrobacterium tumefaciens, and then of course the wonderful citrus greening. The, the information that I'll be talking about about how to manage these diseases is not just specific to these four. I'm using these four as specific examples um, with information pulled from the literature, but the concepts really apply to all of these vascular uh, bacterial infections. I also would like to point out that what I'll be speaking about today is not, there has been some new science and new information that has emerged in the last couple of years, but really the important thing that I have learned from Olivier Hassan and from others in, in looking at these nutritional parameters for diseases is not so much new information, but looking at the historical information, looking at the historical science through a different lens, looking at it through a different framework and gaining new insights from connecting the dots of what this nutrition, these nutritional profiles mean, particularly in the context of understanding redox and the biophysics environment that is present within the xylem, that is present within the phloem, and that is present throughout the plant's entire vascular tissue. The context for thinking about diseases in this manner is really thinking about insects and diseases as nature's survival of the fittest mechanisms. They are here to take the unhealthy plants out of the system. So I believe that it is possible to grow plants that can be completely resistant to disease as long as they're supported with the right nutrition and with the right microbial biome, microbiome. Both of those are important. You can't have, if you just have really good mineral nutrition, but you don't have the proper microbiome, you're not going to be able to achieve strong disease resistance and vice versa. It really requires both. And for more information on the microbiome that is required for disease resistance, there's obviously a lot of really good information um, available today that wasn't available even a decade ago. But some new information that I'm very excited about and have been referring a lot of people to is Dr. James White's work on rhizophagy. Um, so you can just do a Google search for James White and rhizophagy. You'll find some of his published papers and he's has a number of YouTube clips. I hosted him on the podcast. And uh, we also put together a course with him on the Academy. The the simple, and in, for this context, this information, the, the simple version of describing James White's work is to say that we have endophytes that are free living organisms throughout the plant's entire structure, including the vascular tissue, that have a symbiotic relationship with the plant and have the capacity to help suppress diseases on the leaf surface, in the rhizosphere, and also within the plant's vascular tissue. There's a lot more research and homework that needs to be done in this area, but his research is fascinating and will give you some very good insights. There are two different types of plant immunity that can be achieved in the field. The first type is what I refer to as passive immunity, where we simply, we know that every organism, every disease organism, every insect has a specific nutritional profile and a specific type of environment that it requires in order to thrive. And the concept of passive immunity is the idea that we simply remove that optimal environment. We make sure that the plant doesn't provide the nutrition and the right environment, the right context for that potential pathogen to express itself. We know that many of these organisms that we refer to as pathogens are quite ubiquitous in the environment. They're almost universally present. If we take uh, some Fusarium subspecies, for example, or some Phytophthora species, we know that they are present throughout the entire soil profile in many agricultural soils. When you have a disease expressing itself, one field that has succumbed to the disease and a second that has not, there is often very little or even no difference in the quantity of the pathogenic organism in each gram of soil. The only difference is the other suppressive organisms that are either present or absent. And this is in the context of a soil environment, but the same concept also holds true for managing 
diseases within plant tissue, within plant structure, and on plant leaf surfaces as well. The second type of immunity is active immunity, where plants are actively producing immune compounds or resistance compounds from the induced systemic resistance and systemic acquired resistance pathway, which are sometimes referred to as the salicylic acid or jasmonic or jasminate pathway. As an example of the, the type of thinking and some of the type of experiences that we've had in the past, I wanted to speak to our experience with bacterial canker on cherries. Um, so bacterial can canker, you have uh, Pseudomonas syringiae that in, is not specific to the phloem, it's not specific to the xylem, but it is throughout the entire vascular structure and throughout the entire um, tree structure in the cytoplasm as a bacterial infection, and it is considered to be essentially untreatable. You can cut out the damaged tissue and try to prevent it from spreading, um, but it does tend to sp spread fairly easily and quickly, and it is a significant challenge. So we began working with this particular uh, producer, which is Mike Omeg. Some of you may have heard me speak of him in the past. In 2000, 13 or 14, if I recall correctly, somewhere in that time frame. And when we first began working with Mike, he had some blocks that had severe bacterial canker. And we started working on some of these blocks and bacterial canker completely disappeared. The cankers that were present dried up and they were still there, but they did not spread, they didn't propagate. And eventually three years went by with no reoccurrence of bacterial canker. And uh, if you've listened to the podcast, I interviewed Dr. Lynn Long from Oregon State University and also Mike Omeg, and both of them confirmed that bacterial canker had completely disappeared on these trees. And uh, this is a photo of a field day that we hosted at Mike's farm, and he's holding a poster with the block that was so severely infected three years prior. Um, that is, he's standing in front of these trees right now. So these are the trees before and after, three years later. And when we first began working with this block, Mike's intention was to give us a one-year opportunity to see if we could reverse them. And if not, he was going to doze them out and start over. So uh, in that three-year period, we were able to take yields from two tons up to eight tons per acre, and the trees completely recovered. If you want more information on this story, I'm not going to go in depth into what we did and the results that were observed, but you can, uh, Mike Omeg has a video, our YouTube channel, where he has shared videos about what they were seeing both before and then also after. He has this one video that you'll be able to click on and then you get the slide deck around the video. And um, you can actually see firsthand what they observed and what they experienced in their orchard. So. The question that we need to begin thinking about is, all right, if it's true that changes in nutrition and changes in the soil environment and the microbial environment can change a plant's susceptibility or resistance to disease, how can we measure that and how can we manage that? So I want to offer a different perspective that um, I've been learning about for the last couple of years and how to manage and measure these. So this is a perspective based on looking at a plant from a biophysics perspective rather than a biochemistry or a nutritional perspective. This is research that was originally, uh, is built on research that was originally done by Louis-Claude Vincent in France in the 1950s and 60s. And he developed this terminology of measuring plant bioelectronics, where he was measuring uh, EH, pH, and electrical conductivity. Uh, originally, he was looking at water and human health, and then that transferred to agriculture. And he developed this diagram where he had pH across the bottom of the chart and EH, uh, electrical, or not electrical conductivity, but redox along the left hand side of the chart. And he divided the chart into four quadrants. And so you would have a quadrant that was alkaline and oxidized, a quadrant that was alkaline and reduced, and acid and oxidized and acid reduced and so forth. And he identified different diseases as expressing in different quadrants, fungi versus viruses versus bacteria, et cetera. His 
research has been updated and brought up to 2020 and even beyond 2020 by Olivier Hussan. Um, Olivier Hussan has done incredible research on evaluating and monitoring plant health and identifying the zones where plants become susceptible or resistant to different types of diseases and insects. So this is a slide. Uh, I've borrowed several slides from Olivier Hassan's presentations that I'll be sharing with you, uh, and I want to offer some context for them. So uh, this is, these are Olivier's words, is that plants are not necessarily a resource for their bioaggressors, for their pathogens, but they are they are so, they're only a resource, they can only be consumed when they are imbalanced, particularly in regards to redox, pH, and electrical conductivity. And we can, through agricultural practices, cropping systems, and nutrition management, modify these conditions and characteristics in plants to make them unfavorable for the pathogens. This is the foundation. If we can manage these pieces, we can prevent these organisms from ever infecting a plant in the first place, and when they are present, as in the case of bacterial canker on cherries, we can actually reverse it because we create an environment in which they can no longer express themselves. This slide is incredibly powerful and enough to make your head spin. This is based on Olivier Hussan's work. He put this together and he describes this as his redox map of the worlds. And essentially, um, this is way too much information on one slide for me to go into and explain and clarify on a short webinar. But the essence is that you see along the bottom of the chart, we have a pH, we have pH from going from a 3 to a 10 in this zone. On the left-hand side of the chart, we have redox or EH measured in millivolts. And then diagonally across the chart, we have these various zones that are expressed as PE plus pH. That gets into some of the biochemistry that we won't go into right now. But in essence, um, if you're familiar with redox, you're familiar with the idea of reduced versus oxidized environments. And the simplest way of expressing this is as you move towards the upper right of, the, of this diagram, you're moving in the direction of being more oxidized. And as you move towards the lower left, you move in the direction of being more reduced. And in the context of plants, photosynthesis is a very powerful reducing process. So it has the function of reducing the soil of the plant leaves and the entire plant structure. And then there are other factors which occur that have an oxidizing effect, and we're going to get into some of those. But what he has described is that each of these groups of organisms can only cause an infection in a plant within one of these zones. So we have the zone of viruses and the red zone, the lower right-hand side, and um, umycetes bacteria, even further down on the lower right-hand side. So the umycetes would be um, organisms such as Phytophthora and so forth. Then we have the biotrophic fungi, necrotrophic fungi, and different types of insects. And if you look at this, the optimal zone, when we have this optimal zone for plant health and nutrition that is on the lower left-hand side of the chart, that is essentially in a millivoltage, where you see the line that goes from millivolt 300 down to a pH 7, this is the zone where plants can be completely resistant to all of these various diseases. And not only can they become resistant, but they can also reverse infections that have already occurred in the past. So if you want to learn more, there is a lot of information here and too much for me to really get into right now. If you want to learn more, uh, we worked to put together an in-depth course with Olivier where he teaches the science and the principles behind this that he has developed uh, titled Understanding Redox Potential. You can this course is available for free on our academy, regen.ag academy. And I would very much encourage you to go there and take that course. It is intense. There's a lot of new information that you may have never heard of before, but it will give you a completely different perspective on how to manage diseases and how to think about producing plants that can resist disease before they ever show up in the first place. So when we produce the course, one of the 
initial attendees to our introductory webinars asked an important question. It was actually Greg Penneroyle. A uh, big shout out to Greg for asking good questions. Thank you, Greg. And Greg asked the question, what are the differences in this zone, in this environment between a xylem-borne and phloem-borne bacterial infections? Olivier didn't know the answer to that question, but he started combing through the research to try to find the answer to that question. And it led to some completely new insights or additional insights in the work that he was doing. And rather than having these very large nebul nebulous zones of where organisms would infect the plant, he was actually able to narrow down these zones very precisely and very accurately. So this is our slide that he put together for Xylella specifically, and where he identified a very specific zone of where this organism expresses itself and the environment that it requires in order to successfully reproduce and cause an infection. So we now have a zone that's much smaller rather much larger. And I'm only sharing this one slide um, for right now. Olivier is in the process of publishing several additional papers with this information. So we can see that now, instead of having this large nebulous zone, we have this very specific dot on the map, on the chart, where xylella can produce an infection. And if we can keep the plant out of that zone, then we can produce plants that are resistant to xylella. And I'm using xylella as an example, but Olivia has been able to take this and, and identify those very specific locations for a broad range of diseases uh, for many different types of crops. And that's the information that will be published in the coming months. So in general, the very high level perspective overview is that each of these vascular ex infections express themselves when plants are grown in excessively oxidized environments. So let's unwrap this a little bit. Environmental factors which are oxidizing, which have an oxidizing effect are high soil temperatures, dry soil conditions, soils that are very aerobic, soils that have an abundance, almost excessive levels of gas exchange and that are dominated by aerobic bacteria. So these aerobic bacteria, can also be termed oxidizing bacteria because of the influence that they have on, let's say, on nitrogen. Now, scientists, researchers in different fields use different terminology to talk about the exact same thing. So we might use the term aerobic bacteria, or we might use the term oxidizing bacteria, or we might use the term nitrifying bacteria and nitrifiers, where they convert ammonium to nitrate from the reduced to the oxidized state. Those are different terminologies, all describing exactly the same thing. And these are all organisms and groups of organisms that have the effect of producing an oxidized soil environment with primarily oxidized nutrients, which is a problem when we want to begin managing these diseases. So the challenge is that and the opportunity is that these oxidizing factors, if we want to produce disease resistant plants, these oxidizing factors should be counterbalanced. We should balance them out with cultural management practices. So it's not that oxidation is a bad thing. It's not that oxidation is universally bad and reduction is universally good or vice versa. We require both, but we require both to be in balance. And the problem that we have today in our agricultural ecosystems is that we have developed management systems which don't balance out the oxidizing and reducing effects in the ecosystem. Instead, we are completely off on one end of the spectrum with practices and environments and ecosystems that are excessively oxidized, which leads to the expression of all these vascular diseases. So, our challenge is that we often add even more oxidizing factors to the landscape. We have bare soils. We add uh, high electrical conductivity salt fertilizers or ionic fertilizers, such as potassium chloride and uh, different forms of nitrogen, et cetera. Limestone, surprisingly enough, actually has an oxidizing effect as well. Nitrate nitrogen is a particularly effective oxidizer and has a significant influence on these vascular diseases and, and diseases in general. And then, of course, there's also glyphosate. 
And um, this list is much longer. I mean, you could add, if you wanted to go into some detail, you could add a list that would be pages long of cultural management practices and things that we do that have an oxidizing effect. I just highlighted some of the most significant ones. And I specifically included glyphosate. It's not that glyphosate in the jug or when it's applied to the soil has a directly significant oxidizing effect in my understanding. But the effect that it does have is that it alters the soil microbiome. It enhances all of the oxidizing bacteria or the nitrifying bacteria, and it suppresses all the reducing organisms in the reducing microbiome. So indirectly, it has the effect of producing a significant oxidizing effect on the environment. Now, you pause for just a moment and you look at this picture, you think about the soils that are predisposed to having very high incidence of Pierce's disease on grapes. This describes the picture. You have bare soils in many cases. They're exposed to the sunlight. They're high temperature. We're adding some salt fertilizers. And because of everything else that is happening with bare soils and high temperatures, a very aerobic soil, the soil being very oxidized, all the nitrogen that is added, even if it is added in the form of urea or ammonium, rapidly gets converted to nitrate. So we have soils which contain nitrate nitrogen. And in many cases, we're adding glyphosate. So all of these have a very strong oxidizing effect. This creates the environment that is necessary and needed for the development of Pierce's disease or citrus greening, or Gauss's wilt on corn, or sudden death syndrome on soybeans, or bacterial canker on cherries and stone fruit. The list just kind of goes on and on. All of these vascular bacterial infections require soils to be excessively oxidized. And if we manage this environment differently, we can produce an environment in context. We've, we've all seen fields where uh, we have Pierce's disease really intense in one part of the block and completely missing in another part of the block and it doesn't seem to spread. Why the difference? The difference is because of what is happening and has happened in that soil historically. Perhaps it has a different ge geological base. There can be different things going on, but there are always reasons why you have some plants, the exact same variety, managed the same way in the same block, but one section is very susceptible and the next section is resistant. The difference is in the environment. I wanted to speak a little bit about nitrogen specifically. Don Huber was the first of the research that I've read. Uh, his papers that were published, I think, first beginning back in the 60s and the 50s on different forms of nitrogen and the influence they have on disease. You can find lots of his papers online if you want to dig into them. But the short version is that for many diseases, not all, there are a few outliers. But for many diseases, nitrate nitrogen very strongly enhances infections. And if you look at this, nitrate nitrogen, you see the, the chemistry formula is NO3. It has the presence of oxygen, which means that it is in the oxidized form. Ammonium nitrogen, in the NH4 form, is the reduced form of nitrogen that is present in reduced environments or reduced soils. And it often has the effect of suppressing these various diseases. And again, this is, I'm giving you a very high level general overview. There's lots of literature if you want to dig into this a bit more deeply. Um, I would also highly recommend the podcast interviews that I've done with Don, where, I, where I've actually asked him a lot of these questions about ammonium versus nitrate, nitrogen and, the form, uh, and their effects on disease suppression. In a personal conversation with Don um, last week, I was asking him about the influence of nitrogen and these various environments specific specifically on Pierce's disease. And his answer was very simple. He said, well, John, it's very simple. It's impossible to have Pierce's disease on reduced soils that have adequate levels of manganese. When you have an oxidized soil environment and the wrong form of nitrogen and don't have available manganese, you're going to get Pierce's disease. He said, all the field experience and everything that we've observed indicates that this is definitely true. We've observed this in the field. So let's look at manganese. I mentioned it in the context of that conversation, plants, primarily most crops, principally absorb manganese in the reduced form. It's not physiologically active in the plant in the oxidized form. 
and it is generally poorly available in oxidized soils. Even though the soil analysis shows you have generous levels of manganese, it's not very readily available. When you have soils that are dominated by these aerobic oxidizing or nitrifying microbial communities, then you're going to often have limited manganese availability. And this is true to such a degree that on sap analysis, we can even observe a correlation between the levels of manganese that are absorbed from the, from the soil and the crop's degree of disease resistance. So this is a quote, or a couple of quotes that I pulled from a Mineral Nutrition and Plant Disease, which I highly recommend. The information in these chapters goes into a lot more detail. And this is really interesting. So before Olivier's work, uh, I was thinking of many of these diseases and correlated with nitrogen, correlated to being to the presence of different forms of nitrogen as an ammonium or nitrate. And I didn't fully connect the dots that the presence of ammonium or nitrate are the expression of a reduced or an oxidized environment. The presence or absence of manganese is the expression of a reduced or oxidized environment. So these are a couple of quotes from Don. Survival, germination, growth, and variation of pathogens may be influenced by the form, amount and form of nitrogen. That's very soft language. Further on in, in the book, it says that it most definitely is. And nitrogen may affect the virulence of a pathogen by stimulating or inhibiting the enzyme synthesis or activity required for pathogenesis. So let's look at all of these, all of this context. I've tried to connect some of the dots. Now I want to give you a specific example, specific story. This is also a quote from Mineral Nutrition and Plant Disease. An application of this strategy is a novel method of control for citrus variegated chlorosis caused by Xylella fastidiosa. So we're talking about citrus, but it's the same organism and it requires the same type of environment as it does in grapes or in any other crop. In this system, a brachiaria species a grass that inhibits nitrification. Now, what does that tell you? When you look at this science through a different lens, through the lens that Olivier has provided of reduction versus ox oxidation, it says this grass inhibits nitrification. Therefore, it inhibits oxidation. Therefore, it enhances a reduced environment in the soil profile and these reducing organisms. So it increases manganese availability, and it makes sure that all the nitrogen present is present in the form of ammonium. The moment I read that phrase, a grass that inhibits nitrification, it tells me all of the other things that this grass does in this ecosystem. So this grass inhibits nitrification and it's grown between the rows of citrus. It is optimally fertilized, mowed twice a year under the citrus trees to provide weed control and nutrients as the mulch mineralizes. With nitrification inhibited, it provides only ammonium as a nitrogen source for the citrus and increases manganese uptake by 50% so that the disease is suppressed and overall tree growth and productivity are enhanced. And there's the reference, and there was also additional personal communication in 2003. These are the dots that I wanted to connect. Reduction versus oxidation, nitrification, ammonium versus nitrate, and manganese. These are kind of the highlights, these are the signal posts that you can observe and manage to observe whether your ecosystems are reduced or oxidized and your degree of disease resistance or disease susceptibility. For this, in, in this case, this reference is specific to Xylella fastidiosa in citrus, but the concept is universal across all of these diseases. When we look at crown gall on walnuts, Agrobacterium tumefaciens, um, there's a couple of references here. The addition of glycine, we can look at the redox values of glycine in the system. And interestingly enough, when we look at iron, we've been focusing on manganese so far, but this quote, abundant levels of oxidized iron are known to stimulate uh, Agrobacterium. So we know that we have we can have either ferric or ferrous iron in soil systems and various siderophores that are absorbed by plants. So you can have uh, Fe2+, plus, Fe3+, plus, et cetera. One form enhances the presence of the disease and the infection rate, and the other form suppresses it. Which do you think suppresses it? 
it's the reduced form. Again, it comes back to reduction and oxidation and looking. So this is simply going back and looking at the historical research that has already been done and connecting the dots and looking at them from a perspective of reduction and oxidation and asking what is the environment that is required to be present in order to allow this disease to express itself. And if you go back to the citrus example I was just speaking about with Xylella fastidiosa, that was a cultural management practice. They grew a specific cover crop that had a reducing effect instead of an oxidizing effect and used that as mulch and that treated the disease. You can have a similar effect by managing nutrition and by managing biology or by managing cover crops. There are many different levers that you can touch to produce that effect. So I want to jump into the questions and answers. Uh, the key piece I would suggest, if, if you want to solve these problems, we need to, to look at the historical science that has already been done through a different lens. We already have the knowledge, we have the information, we just need to connect the dots. So if you want to solve these problems in your fields or to get more information, just call us at AEA. We're very excited to be connecting these dots and putting more of the information together and uh, we're having a lot of fun doing it in the field. So uh, I'm going to switch to Q&A and answer any questions that you might have. First question that is here from Katarina. Hi Katarina, glad to see you here. Do you have something to say about Phytophthora uh, cinnamomy that affect almost every fruit tree? So what I have to say about Phytophthora is that uh, for the blocks or the trees that are resistant versus the trees that are susceptible, there is no difference usually in the presence of Phytophthora in the soil environment. The difference is in the suppressive organisms and Phytophthora also does require an oxidized environment in the soil. Uh, we've had experiences with different Phytophthora subspecies on different crops and one of the treatments uh, this is an example of the effect that an oxidation or reduced environment, oxidizer reduced environment can have. One of the treatments that was recommended for Phytophthora on peppers on an organic farm was to inject hydrogen peroxide into the irrigation system. So they were injecting hydrogen peroxide at fairly significant rates. I want to say in the neighborhood of uh, several gallons of 35% H2O2 per acre inch. And that treatment resulted in an explosion of Phytophthora. It made the Phytophthora worse, not better. Why? Because it changed the soil environment. It had an oxidizing effect. We know that hydrogen peroxide is an oxidizer. It has an oxidizing effect. And so it actually increased the pressure of Phytophthora. Um, sulfuric acid can do the same thing. It's also a strong oxidizer. So we need to identify the cultural management practices or the products or the microbial inoculants that we can use that have a reducing effect. And when we shift that soil profile to be primarily reduced instead of primarily oxidized, we're going to see this disease drop off significantly. Question from Kish Johnson. Hi Kish. Um, should the nutritional management program be the same on a new block of stone fruit trees that are in their pre-production years, the blocks that are already in production? Or does a newly planted block afford us the opportunity to address certain potential problems without the stress of, of fruit production? Um, so the answer to your second question is definitely yes. You have an opportunity when the trees are not under fruit load where any nutritional treatments that you apply often tend to produce a bigger tree response and a bigger resistance response because uh, the tree is not under fruit load. And so to your first question, should the nutritional program, management program be the same? Uh, the answer is obviously no because they're not under fruit load. So here's the way that I would answer it is to say that you need to have the same levels of nutritional integrity in young trees as in old trees. So for example, if you're looking at sap analysis, you need the same ratios between calcium and magnesium and calcium and nitrogen and so forth. But the quantity of nutrients required to maintain those ratios are completely different for young trees as they are for old trees because the young trees are not under a fruit load. They're not producing a crop. A question on our products, does your Micropack product 
contain nutrients in the reduced form? And the answer is yes. Uh, all of our rebound line of trace minerals, all of our trace minerals are available in the reduced form. And then the second question, this is from Stevie Henry. Uh, hi, Stevie. How can we keep nitrogen in an ammonium form in row crops? Well, it's a big question. You stop doing all the things which have an oxidizing effect, which means that you don't allow your soil surface to be bare and exposed to the sun because that converts to nitrate. You don't allow your soils to, and in the same vein, you don't allow your soils to become very warm and, and have high temperatures because that um, triggers nitrification and the conversion to nitrate. You don't have soils that are excessively tilled and have very strong oxygen flow because that has an oxidizing effect and triggers the conversion to nitrate. And you can, the, the, the simple answer is that when your soils are in the reduced state and you have a balance between aerobic and anaerobic organisms and you have a balance between uh, reduction and oxidation, your soil will maintain the optimal ammonium versus nitrate ratio at different stages of plant development on its own, all by itself. But the soil needs to be cool. It needs to be not too dry and not exposed to direct sunlight and have good gas exchange and obviously with good moisture as well. When all of those factors are in place, then this works by itself. And we could be having a conversation about nitrification inhibitors, which I think are generally not a wise idea. Um, they're wise in the short term, yes, but their long-term microbial consequences are uh, not fully known. At least I don't fully know and understand that there aren't long-term negative consequences. And in other webinars, I've talked about how to manage the different forms of nitrogen. Ultimately, we want our plants to absorb nitrogen in the form of amino acids, not nitrates and not ammonium, through the rhizophagy process. And that can happen and does happen as a result of good microbial systems. Question from Tom Willie. Hi, Tom. Uh, citrus greening has existed in China for a century. Presuming citrus still exists there, how have they dealt with the problem? I don't know the answer to that question, Tom. Um, that is an interesting question, something that would be worth pursuing. But when you think about historical citrus management, um, what I'm most familiar with is citrus management in Florida. They have fairly sandy soils. It used to be true, let's say approximately 40 years ago, that um, these soils would have compost applied every year they would grow a lush cover crop or green manure crop underneath the trees of different grasses that would then be mowed and mulched and the crops would be irrigated as well that was pretty much uh, there was some additional attrition application as well but most of it was coming from compost and mulch then came the introduction of roundup and they changed to applying glyphosate a minimum of three to four times per year, sometimes as much as six to eight times per year for weed control. Now the soils were completely bare. They're exposed to the sun. And so you have soils that are at high temperatures. You no longer have the, the mulch and the cover crop species. They start burning off organic matter, burning off their historical applications of compost. And over a period, it, it's taken a while for this to catch up with them, but over a period of a decade or two, you now have soils that are extremely oxidized. You no longer have the historical base of organic matter that was applied. That has been completely burned off. You have these continual applications of glyphosate and you have the absolute perfect environment for citrus greening. Uh, in conversations with Don and also from personal work that we have done in Florida, I know that you only have citrus greening on plants which have um, high levels of free ammonium in the leaves. But that ammonium doesn't come from the soil to the leaves. This is, we're getting into the weeds a little bit here. But what is actually happening is that these trees are no longer picking up the manganese and the form of iron that they need and other trace minerals that they need to convert the ammonium in the leaf into the amino acid form, into amino acids and into proteins. So, the citrus industry in Florida is one 
this is, I'm speaking in the Florida context because it's where I have the most personal experience and observation. It's like a plane that has been uh, falling for a long time and it's only recently crashed and is burning. Um, but it's, it's taken a while to get there to the point where we are right now. It's a very good question though, Tom, and it's something that I will look into a bit more closely. What is the mechanism behind Erwinia? And how could that be managed from a farm management perspective? Erwinia being the causative organism for fire blight, for those of you not familiar with it. Um, so the brief answer is that Erwinia also exists when you have an imbalanced nutritional profile and you have soils and or plant systems that are excessively oxidized. And it can be most closely compared to, I think, probably crown gall, but also to Pierce's disease. The reality, there's a lot of overlap. Um, there, is, there are differences between those organisms that infect only the phloem and only the xylem and versus those that inf affect, infect the entire vascular tissue. So, and there are also differences in these organisms based on their entry point of infection. Is it the leaf, is it the root, et cetera. Um, Olivier has promised to publish this information um, in some additional papers and webinars in the coming months at some point, hopefully if all goes well later this year. I'll certainly, we will be sharing this information on, um, on the Academy and also in further blog posts. So if you want to learn more about that as we release that, you can learn more about it on the blog. Uh, question from Gilliam. How the, hi there. Um, how do you manage reduction with nutrition? Well, the obvious example is with nitrogen applications. Are you applying nitrogen in the form of ammonium or nitrate? Are you applying sulfur in the form of sulfuric acid, which is an oxidizer, or thiosulfate, which is also has an effect, but much less so, or let's say gypsum? So what is the form of the nutrients that you are applying? Is it in the reduced or oxidized form? And what effect does that have on the soil chemistry directly and also on the microbial profile? Question from Greg Stack. What is, the, what is a practical method to measure the redox level of a grape plant in a vineyard? Can I do this at home? Or should wood or leaf samples be sent to a lab? I can measure pH and bricks levels from squeezing sap from grape leaves with meters on hand. Greg? This is the uh, $64,000 question, as the saying goes. The answer is you can measure it. And also, the value that you get when you measure it is almost meaningless. And that sounds like an oxymoron, but it's really not. Here's why. So you can get what are called ORP meters, which are stand, stands for oxidation reduction potential. You can buy ORP meters for under $100, 70 to $90 usually, so similar price to pH meter. And they're fairly accurate. But the challenge is that in biological systems, the numbers fluctuate wildly. If you have soil that is dry and hasn't been irrigated for three or four days, and you measure it, it can show up as being oxidized. You get an inch of rainfall, and it switches to reduced. So it can, the numbers can fluctuate very dramatically in soil profiles. It's not the number itself that is really important. It is the balance, the overall balance, the, the range fluctuates significantly in the soil profile. But what is really important to manage is, do you have a balanced microbial population where you have a balance of aerobic and anaerobic organisms, nitrifiers versus denitrifiers, and reducing versus oxidizing. And the expression of this that you can measure is you can measure, are your plants absorbing adequate levels of manganese? Are they absorbing the majority of their nitrogen in the form of ammonium, or are they getting nitrate? Those are really the things that matter from a disease resistance perspective. You can measure the nutritional profile and use the nutritional profile as an analog indicator of what is happening in the soil profile. And there are several people who are working on developing sensors that we can use in the fields to measure the redox values on the plant leaf surface and use that to predict disease and insect susceptibility. 
that's technology that I believe will be coming in the future. It might still be a couple of years away, but it, uh, it seems reasonable to expect that it'll come at some point. And uh, that will then give us a tool that we may be able to get more information more reliably than we can right now with the ORP meters. Uh, also, one more point to your point on getting it from plant sap. It's very challenging to get it from get a reliable reading from plant sap because of the significant differences between the phloem and the xylem. So the xylem redox values correspond to the nutritional profile that is being a nutritional integrity that is being absorbed from the soil because xylem is really the water transport pipeline that is doped with nutrients coming from the soil upward. The phloem, on the other hand, is an extremely proton-rich environment, has a very high pH because of sucrose and sugars being transferred from the leaves into the phloem occurs as a result of a proton pump. So you get these high proton concentrations in the phloem. Point is simply that there are significant variations in redox values between xylem and phloem and other locations within the leaf. So it's not the value itself that is really important to measure. But let me say it, uh, let me say it a little bit differently. We know that pH is a result of nutritional balance or imbalance. And in the same way, redox is a result of nutritional balance or imbalance. So if we manage the nutritional balance, then the redox will automatically be balanced where it needs to be. And that's really what we can measure and manage the most accurately and the most sensitively at this point in time. Question from Stevie Henry, uh, what are some reducing cover crops and reducing inoculants? Um, I answered this question in detail in a couple of webinars that we've done in the past on the rise of phage cycle, nitrogen absorption, and um, how to produce a disease suppressive soil. So I think if you go to YouTube and you look for a webinar on producing disease suppressive soils, I specifically talk about cover crops and inoculants that produce this reducing environment in the soil profile. Question from Ravindra on Xanthomonas species and subspecies in pomegranates. Will reduced conditions help? The answer is yes. And uh, I would also refer you to those other webinars that I spoke of for your questions on foliar applications. And uh, we also have a webinar on how to properly design foliar applications that also will answer your question on foliar absorbed nutrients. Good questions, thank you. Uh, question from Kyle Rash. Copper products are often oxidizing. Is copper for bacterial disease causing a net negative to tree health since it is not reducing? I'm not certain, Kyle. I don't know the answer for sure. I know that in general, um, our experience and observation would be that while it produces a short-term positive and it might prevent, prevent a short-term bacterial infection, it can actually predispose the tree or the plant to further infections down the road. And the best tool is to actually get copper, rather than using copper as a bactericide on the leaf surface, let's get copper as a nutrient into the leaf. And when you raise the, the nutrient levels of copper in the leaf, that will actually have as big or bigger an impact on disease resistance as the bacterial coating on the leaf surface. And you don't need to worry about it washing off and it's a lot less expensive and it's a lot stabler. So lots of wins on that one. Question from James Pingree, I've used copper treatments to treat some bacterial cankers. Are there any tox effects on beneficial endophytes with excessive copper levels? And I know for certain that there are in the soil I don't know about implant vascular tissue. I would imagine there are, but I haven't read the research about that if it has been done, so I don't know. The follow-up question from Greg, uh, is fish oil providing a reduced form of nitrogen? Actually, the form of nitrogen in liquid fish would be uh, in the form of amino acids, so it's not necessarily either oxidized or reduced, and it is in the form that adds the most energy to plants. It's a very valuable and useful form. A uh, question from Barbara, is there a soil test that shows the specific chemical form of nutrients in our field? Mm, I'm sure there probably is, but I'm also not aware that it is a test that is commonly run on soils, and I'm sure it would be expensive. But again, if I could just make one more, just repeat this point once more, it is not about managing the chemistry in our soils. 
It's about managing the biology in our soils. Because when we manage the biology and the ratios of reducing versus oxidizing organisms, they take care of everything else. They will manage the oxidized or the reduced form of nutrients that are in the soil profile. We simply need to focus on managing the biology. How do humates, humic substances, and fulvic acids affect the redox in the soil? Um, which one is preferred, humic or fulvic acids? The answer is both. We prefer both. And the way they, these humic substances and organic matter influence um, redox values is they increase redox poisoning. What does that mean? You may have heard of, of pH buffering. What is a soil's capacity to buffer rapid swings in the pH? And the same is true of redox when we call it redox poisoning. So really healthy soils with high organic matter levels and abundant microbial activity have a very high redox poisoning effect, which is that this rapid swing, these rapid fluctuations don't happen nearly as rapidly anymore. The soil is much more stable and therefore the plant is much more stable as well. So there's a few more questions here, but I think I have answered all of them uh, earlier and other questions. There's some duplications here. So I want to thank all of you for your time and your interaction. I hope you found the information valuable and useful. You'll be able to see a copy of the slide deck on SlideShare and see the video on YouTube afterwards if you want to share it with others. And would ask you to reach out and connect with the AEA team. If you haven't yet, subscribe to my blog. And I look forward to having a conversation with you in our next webinar. Have an awesome day. Thanks, everyone. Happy growing.